This is a recording of an article on Wikipedia and was recorded by user Popular Outcast. The material recorded is current as of the May 29, 2008 revision of the article. D.B. Cooper from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. D.B. Cooper, a.k.a. Dan Cooper, is an alias of an aircraft hijacker who, on November 24, 1971, after receiving a ransom payout of 200000 U.S. dollars, jumped from the back of a Boeing 727 as it was flying over the Pacific Northwest of the United States, possibly over Woodland, Washington. Despite hundreds of suspects through the years, no conclusive evidence has surfaced regarding Cooper's identity or whereabouts. The FBI believes he did not survive the jump. Several theories offer competing explanations of what happened after his famed jump. The nature of Cooper's escape and the uncertainty of his fate continue to intrigue people. The Cooper case, codenamed Norjack by the FBI, remains an unsolved mystery. The Cooper case has baffled both government and private investigators for decades, with countless leads turning into dead ends. As recently as March 2008, the FBI thought it might have had one of the biggest breakthroughs in the case when children unearthed a parachute within the bounds of Cooper's probable jump site near the town of Amboy, Washington. Experts later revealed that it did not belong to the hijacker. Still, Despite the case's infamy for its enduring lack of evidence, a few significant clues have arisen. In late 1978, a placard, which contained instructions on how to lower the aft stairs of a 727, believed to be from the rear stairway of the plane from which Cooper jumped, was found just a few flying minutes north of Cooper's projected drop zone. In February 1980, eight-year-old Brian Ingram found... $5,880 in decaying $20 bills on the banks of the Columbia River. In October 2007, the FBI announced that it had obtained a partial DNA profile of Cooper from the tie he left on the hijacked plane. On December 31, 2007, the FBI revived the unclosed case by publishing never-before-seen composite sketches and fact sheets online in an attempt to trigger memories that could possibly identify Cooper. In a press release, the FBI reiterated that it does not believe Cooper survived the jump, but expressed an interest in obtaining his identity. The following is a listing of the contents of this article. Section 1. Hijacking Section 1.1, You Are Being Hijacked. Section 1.2, Releasing Passengers in Exchange for Demands. Section 1.3, Back in the Skies. Section 2, Vanished Without a Trace. Section 3, Aftermath. Section 3.1, Effect on the Airline Industry. Section 3.2, Suspects. Section 3.2.1, John List. Section 3.2.2, .2, Richard McCoy, Jr. Section 3.2.3, .3, Dwayne Weber. Section 3.2.4, .4, Kenneth Christensen. Section 4, Recent Developments. Section 4.1, Renewed FBI Interest and New Evidence. Section 5, See Also. Section 6, Further Reading. Section 7, References. Section 8, External Links. The following is an info box which accompanies this article and gives a summary of the main information about D.B. Cooper to supplement the arrangement of information in this article. D.B. Cooper's other name was Dan Cooper. His occupation was unknown. He was known for hijacking a Boeing 727 on November 24, 1971 and parachuting out of the plane. An image accompanies this info box with the caption, A 1972 FBI Composite Drawing of D.B. Cooper. Section 1. Hijacking Section 1.1. You are being hijacked. 
On Wednesday, November 24, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving in the United States, a man traveling under the name Dan Cooper boarded a Boeing 727-100 Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, FAA registered N467 U.S., flying from Portland International Airport, PDX, in Portland, Oregon, to Seattle, Washington. Cooper was described as being in his mid-forties and between five feet ten inches and six feet tall. He wore a black raincoat, loafers, a dark suit, a neatly pressed white-collared shirt, a black necktie, black sunglasses, and a mother-of-pearl tie pin. Cooper sat in the back of the plane in seat 18C. After the jet had taken off from Portland, he handed a note to a young flight attendant named Florence Schaffner, who was seated in a jump seat attached to the aft stair door, situated directly behind and to the left of Cooper's seat. She thought he was giving her his phone number, so she slipped it, unopened, into her pocket. Cooper leaned closer and said, quote, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. End quote. In the envelope was a note that read, quote, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I will use it if necessary. I want you to sit next to me. You are being hijacked. End quote. The note also provided demands for $200,000 in unmarked $20 bills and two sets of parachutes, two main back chutes and two emergency chest chutes. The note carried instructions ordering the items to be delivered to the plane when it landed at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. If the demands were not met, he would blow up the plane. When the flight attendant informed the cockpit about Cooper and the note, the pilot, William Scott, contacted Seattle-Tacoma Air Traffic Control, who contacted Seattle Police and the FBI. The FBI contacted Northwest Orient Airlines President Donald Nerup, who instructed Scott to cooperate with the hijacker. Scott instructed Schaffner to go back and sit next to Cooper and ascertain if the bomb was in fact real. Sensing this, Cooper opened his briefcase momentarily, long enough for Schaffner to see red cylinders, a large battery and wires, convincing her the bomb was real. He instructed her to tell the pilot not to land until the money and parachutes Cooper had requested were ready at Seattle-Tacoma. She went back to the cockpit to relay Cooper's instructions. An image accompanies this section with the caption, FBI Wanted Poster of D.B. Cooper. Section 1.2, Releasing Passengers in Exchange for Demands. According to Cooper's demands, the jet was put into a holding pattern over Puget Sound, while Cooper's demands of $200,000 and four parachutes were met. In assembling the cash demands, FBI agents followed Cooper's instruction for unmarked bills, but they decided to give bills printed in 1969 that began with serial numbers beginning with the letter L, issued by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. The agents also photographed all ten thousand twenty dollar bills to keep a microfilm record of all the bill serial numbers. Authorities initially intended to obtain military issue parachutes from McCord Air Force Base, but Cooper said he wanted civilian parachutes which had manually operated rip cords. Seattle police were able to find Cooper's preferred parachutes at a local skydiving school. Meanwhile, Cooper sat in the airplane, drinking bourbon whiskey and soda. Tina Mucklow, a flight attendant who spent the most time with the hijacker, remarks Cooper, quote, seemed rather nice, end quote, and thoughtful enough to request the crew be brought meals after the jet landed in Seattle. However, FBI investigators for the Cooper case claim the hijacker was, quote, obscene, end quote, and used, quote, filthy language, end quote. At 1724, airport traffic control radioed Scott and told him that Cooper's demands had been met. Cooper then gave Captain Scott permission to land at the flight's intended destination, Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, SEA, near Seattle, Washington. The plane landed at the airport at 1739. Cooper then instructed Scott to taxi the plane to a remote section of the tarmac and also dim the lights in the cabin to deter police snipers. 
He instructed air traffic control to send one person to deliver the $200,000 and four parachutes unaccompanied. The person chosen, a Northwest Orient Airlines employee, drove to the plane and delivered the cash and parachutes to flight attendant Mucklow via the aft stairs. A few minutes after his demands were met, Cooper released all 36 passengers and attendant Schaffner via the aft stairs. Pilot Scott, flight attendant Mucklow, First Officer Bob Radizak and Flight Engineer H. E. Anderson were not permitted to leave the aircraft. The FBI was puzzled regarding Cooper's plans and his request of four parachutes. The agents wondered if Cooper had an accomplice on board, or if the parachutes were intended for the four people on the plane, the pilot, the co-pilot, a flight attendant, and himself. Up to this point in history, nobody had ever attempted to jump with a parachute from a hijacked commercial aircraft. While the plane was being refueled, an FAA official, who wanted to explain to the hijacker the legal consequences of air piracy, walked to the door of the plane and asked Cooper's permission to come aboard the plane. Cooper promptly denied the official's request. A vapor lock in the fuel tanker truck's engine slowed down the refueling process. Cooper became suspicious when the refueling had still not been completed after fifteen minutes. He made threats to blow up the plane, upon which the fuel crew promptly tried to speed up the job until completion. Section 1.3 Back in the Skies After refueling, careful examination of the ransom and parachutes, and negotiations regarding the flight pattern and the position of the aft stairs upon takeoff, Cooper ordered the flight crew to take the hijacked jet back into the air at around 1940. The crew was ordered to fly to Mexico City at relatively low speed of 170 knots, an altitude at or under 10,000 feet. Normal cruising altitude is between 25,000 and 37,000 feet, with the landing gear down and 15 degrees of flap. However, First Officer Radizak told him that the jet could only fly a thousand miles under the altitude and airspeed conditions Cooper ordered. Cooper and the crew discussed other possible locations, before deciding on flying to Reno, Nevada, where they would again refuel. They also agreed to fly on Victor 23, as depicted on the Jeppesen Air Navigational Charts, a low-altitude federal airway that passed west of the Cascade Range. Cooper then ordered Scott to leave the cabin unpressurized. An unpressurized cabin at 10,000 feet would curtail the risk of a sudden rush of air exiting the plane, and ease the opening of the pressure door if he were to attempt to exit the aircraft for a subsequent parachute landing. Immediately upon takeoff, Cooper asked Mucklow, who had previously been sitting with him, to go back to the cockpit and stay there. Before she went behind the curtain that separates the coach and first-class seats, she watched him tie something to his waist, with what she thought was rope. Moments later in the cockpit, the crew noticed a light flash indicating that Cooper attempted to operate the door. Over the intercom, Scott asked Cooper if there was anything they could do for him, but the hijacker replied curtly, quote, No, end quote. The crew started to notice a change of air pressure in the cabin, an ear-popping experience. Cooper had lowered the aft stairs and jumped out of the plane, never to be seen again. That was the last time D.B. Cooper was known to be alive. The FBI believed his descent was at 2013 over the southwestern portion of the state of Washington, because the aft stairway bumped at this time, most likely due to the weight of Cooper being released from the aft stairs. At the time Cooper jumped, the plane was flying through a heavy rainstorm, with no light source coming from the ground due to cloud coverage. Because of the poor visibility, his descent went unnoticed by the United States Air Force F-106 jet fighters tracking the airliner. He initially was believed to have landed southeast of the unincorporated area of Ariel, Washington, near Lake Merwin, 30 miles north of Portland, Oregon. Later information, including details given from Captain Scott to the FBI in 1980 that led to a more accurate assessment of the flight route, put the jump location about 20 miles farther east. To date, his precise landing zone remains unknown. 
nearly two and a half hours after takeoff from Seattle Tacoma at approximately twenty two fifteen, with the aft stairs dragging on the runway, the Boeing seven twenty seven landed safely in Reno. The airport and runway were surrounded by FBI agents and local police. After communicating with Captain Scott, it was determined Cooper was gone, and FBI agents boarded the plane to search for any evidence left behind. They recovered a number of fingerprints, which may or may not have belonged to Cooper, a tie and mother-of-pearl tie clip, and two of the four parachutes. Cooper was nowhere to be found, nor was his briefcase, the money, the money bag, or the two missing parachutes. The individuals with whom Cooper had interacted on board the plane and while he was on the ground were interrogated to compile a composite sketch. Those interviewed all gave nearly identical descriptions of him, leading the FBI to create the sketch that has been used on wanted posters ever since. As of 2008, the FBI maintains that sketch is an accurate likeness of Cooper because so many individuals interviewed simultaneously in separate locations gave nearly identical descriptions. Section 2. Vanished Without a Trace Despite an 18-day search of the projected landing zone in 1971, no trace of Cooper or his parachute was found. An exact landing point was difficult to determine, as the plane was being battered by 200-mile-per-hour winds at the time of Cooper's jump. This led the FBI to determine that Cooper could not have known exactly where he would land, and therefore must not have had an accomplice waiting to assist him upon landing. A ground search using the assistance of 400 troops from nearby Fort Lewis was conducted in April 1972. After six weeks of searching the projected drop zone on foot, no evidence was found related to the hijacking. As a result, it remains a widely disputed subject whether he survived the jump and then subsequently escaped on foot. Shortly after the hijacking, the FBI questioned and then released a Portland man by the name of D.B. Cooper, who was never considered a significant suspect. Due to a miscommunication with the media, however, the initials D.B. became firmly associated with the hijacker, and this is how he is now known. Meanwhile, the FBI also stepped up efforts to track the 10,000 ransomed $20 bills by notifying banks, savings and loans companies, and other businesses of the note's serial numbers. Law enforcement agencies around the globe, including Scotland Yard, also received information on Cooper and the serial numbers. In the months following the hijacking, Northwest Airlines offered a reward of 15% of the recovered money, up to a maximum of $25,000, but the airline eventually canceled the offer as no no new substantial evidence seemed to arise. In November 1973, the Oregon Journal, based in Portland, began publishing the first public listings of the serial numbers with permission from the FBI, and offered $1,000 to the first person who could claim to have found a single one of the $20 bills. Despite reported interest from around the country and several alleged near matches, the newspaper never received a claim of an exact serial number match. In the decade before the Cooper hijacking, local law enforcement and the FBI had solved at least two major crimes, a bank robbery and an extortion, in the Pacific Northwest by tracing money serial numbers. But both cases, which took only weeks for authorities to solve, involved instances of a perpetrator spending the traceable money only days after the crime and in the same general region of the crime, circumstances that in all likelihood did not apply in the Cooper case. In late 1978, a placard which contained instructions on how to lower the aft stairs of a 727 from the rear stairway of the plane from which Cooper jumped was found by a hunter just a few flying minutes north of Cooper's projected drop zone. On February 10, 1980, Brian Ingram, then eight years old, was with his family on a picnic when he found $5,880 in decaying bills a total of two hundred and ninety four twenty dollar bills still bundled in rubber bands approximately forty feet from the water line and just two inches below the surface on the banks of the columbia river five miles northwest of vancouver washington 
After comparing the serial numbers with those from the ransom given to Cooper almost nine years earlier, it was proven the money found by Ingram was part of the ransom given to Cooper. Upon the discovery, then-FBI lead investigator Ralph Himmelsbach declared that the money, quote, must have been deposited within a couple of years after the hijacking, end quote, because, quote, rubber bands deteriorate rapidly and could not have held the bundles together for very long, end quote. However, some scientists noted their belief that the money arrived at the beach as a result of a 1974 Army Corps of Engineers dredging operation. Furthermore, some scientists estimated that the money's arrival must have occurred even later. Geologist Leonard Palmer of Portland State University, for example, reportedly concluded that the 1974 dredging operation did not place the money on the Columbia's riverbank because Ingram had found the bills above clay deposits put on shore by the dredge. The FBI generally agree now that the money had to have arrived at the location on the river bank no earlier than 1974. Some investigators and hydrologists have theorized that the bundled bills washed freely into the Columbia River from one of its many connecting tributaries, such as the Washougal River, which originate or run near Cooper's suspected landing zone. Ingram's discovery of the $5,880 reinforced the FBI's belief that Cooper probably did not survive the jump, in large part because of the unlikelihood that such a criminal would be willing to leave behind any of the loot for which he had risked his life. Ingram was eventually allowed to keep $2,860 of the money. In 2007, he announced that he planned to auction off the few bills that he still maintains in a bank vault. As of 2008, the remaining amount of money has not been found. An image accompanies this section of the article with caption, Illustration of how the 727's rear air stair was used by Cooper to effect his escape. The air stair has not been designed for deployment in flight and was gravity operated, meaning it fell open and stayed that way until the aircraft landed. Section 3. Aftermath Section 3.1, Effect on the Airline Industry The hijacking caused major changes in commercial flight safety, mainly in the form of metal detectors added to the airports by the airline companies, several related flight safety rules set in place by the FAA, and modifications made to the Boeing 727 aircraft. Following three similar but less successful hijackings in 1972, the Federal Aviation Administration required that all Boeing 727 aircraft be fitted with a device known as the Cooper Vane, named after Cooper, a mechanical aerodynamic wedge that prevents the air stair or rear stairway of an aircraft from being lowered in flight. Section 3.2 Suspects at various points, several people have been suggested as possible candidates for Cooper, although the case remains unsolved. Over the years, the suspect list has exceeded 1,000 people. The FBI believed that Cooper was familiar with the Seattle area, as he was able to recognize Tacoma from the air while the jet was circling over the Puget Sound. He also remarked to flight attendant Mucklow that McCord Air Force Base was approximately 20 minutes from Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. Although the FBI initially believed that Cooper might have been an active or retired member of the United States Air Force, based on his apparent knowledge of jet aerodynamics and skydiving, it later changed this assessment, deciding that no experienced parachutist would have attempted such a risky jump. Section 3.2. An image accompanies this section with the caption, FBI Sketch of Cooper with Age Progression. Section 3.2.1 John List In 1971, mass murderer John List was considered a suspect in the Cooper hijacking, which occurred just after he had killed his family in Westfield, New Jersey. List's age, facial features, and build were similar to those described for the mysterious skyjacker. FBI agent Ralph Himmelsbach stated that List was a, quote, viable suspect, end quote, in the case. Cooper parachuted from the hijacked airliner with $200,000, the same amount List had used up from his mother's bank account in the days before the killing.
After his capture and imprisonment in 1989, Liss strenuously denied being Cooper, and the FBI no longer considered him a suspect. Liss died in prison custody on March 21, 2008. Section 3.2.2 Additional information can be found in Wikipedia article titled Richard McCoy, Jr. On April 7, 1972, four months after Cooper's hijacking, Richard McCoy, Jr., under the alias James Johnson, boarded United Airlines Flight 855 during a stopover in Denver, Colorado, and gave the flight steward an envelope labeled hijack instructions in which he demanded four parachutes and five hundred thousand dollars he also instructed the pilot to land at san francisco international airport and order a refueling truck for the plane the airplane was a boeing seven twenty seven with aft stairs which mccoy used in his escape he was carrying a paperweight grenade and an empty pistol he left his handwritten message on the plane along with his fingerprints on a magazine he had been reading which the fbi later used to establish positive identification police began investigating mccoy following a tip from utah highway patrolman robert van lepperin who was a friend of mccoy's apparently after the cooper hijacking mccoy had made a reference that cooper should have asked for five hundred thousand dollars instead of two hundred thousand dollars van lepperin thought that was an odd coincidence so he alerted the fbi married and with two young children mccoy was a mormon sunday school teacher studying law enforcement at brigham young university he had a record as a vietnam veteran and was a former helicopter pilot and an avid skydiver on April 9th, following the fingerprint and handwriting match, McCoy was arrested for the United 855 hijacking. Coincidentally, McCoy had been on National Guard duty flying one of the helicopters involved in the search for the hijacker. Inside his house, FBI agents found a jumpsuit and a duffel bag filled with $499,970 in cash. McCoy claimed innocence but was convicted and received a 45-year sentence. Once incarcerated, using his access to the prison's dental office, McCoy fashioned a fake handgun out of dental paste. He and a crew of convicts escaped in August 1974 by stealing a garbage truck and crashing it through the prison's main gate. It took three months before the FBI located McCoy in Virginia. McCoy shot at FBI agents, and Agent Nicholas O'Hara fired back with a shotgun, killing him. In 1991, Bernie Rhodes and former FBI agent Russell Kalam co-authored D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, in which they claim that Cooper and McCoy were really the same person, citing similar methods of hijacking and a tie-and-mother-of-pearl tie clipped left on the plane by Cooper. Neither Rhodes nor Kalam were involved in the original Cooper investigation, but Kalam was the head of the Utah FBI office that investigated McCoy and eventually arrested him for the copycat hijacking that occurred in April 1972. The author said that McCoy, quote, never admitted nor denied he was Cooper, end quote, and when McCoy was directly asked whether he was Cooper, he replied, quote, I don't want to talk to you about it, end quote. The agent who supposedly killed McCoy is quoted as saying, quote, When I shot Richard McCoy, I shot D.B. Cooper at the same time. End quote. The widow of Richard McCoy, Karen Burns McCoy, reached a legal settlement with the book's co authors and its publisher. An image accompanies this section with the caption, The Salt Lake Tribune's article about the 1972 capture of Richard McCoy. Section 3.2.3 .3, Dwayne Weber. In July 2000, U.S. News & World Report ran an article about a widow in Pace, Florida, named Jo Weber, and her claim that her late husband, Dwayne L. Weber, born 1924 in Ohio, had told her, quote, I'm Dan Cooper, quote, before his death on March 28, 1995. She became suspicious and began checking into his background. Weber had served in the Army during World War II and had later served in a prison near the Portland airport. Weber recalled that her husband had once had a nightmare where he talked in his sleep about jumping from a plane and said something about leaving his fingerprints on the aft stairs. Joe recalled that shortly before his death, Duane had revealed to her that an old knee injury of his had been incurred by, quote, jumping out of a plane, end quote. Weber also recounts the 1979 vacation the couple took to Seattle, 
quote, a sentimental journey, end quote, Duane told Joe Weber with a visit to the Columbia River. She remembers how Duane walked down to the banks of the Columbia by himself just four months before the portion of Cooper's cash was found in the same area. Weber related that she had checked out a book on the Cooper case from the local library and saw notations in it that matched her husband's handwriting. She began corresponding with Himmelsbach, the former chief investigator of the case, who subsequently agreed that much of the circumstantial evidence surrounding Weber fit the hijacker's profile. However, the FBI stopped investigating Weber in July 1988 because of a lack of hard evidence. The FBI compared Weber's prints with those processed from the hijacked plane and found no matches. In October 2007, the FBI stated that a partial DNA sample taken from the J.C. Penney department store brand tie that Cooper had left on the plane did not belong to Weber. Section 3.2.4 Kenneth Christensen the October 29, 2007 issue of New York Magazine revealed the new suspect, Kenneth P. Christensen, identified by Sherlock Investigations. The article noted that Christensen is a former Army paratrooper, a former airline employee, had settled in Washington near the site of the hijacking, was familiar with the local terrain, had purchased property with cash a year after the hijacking, drank bourbon and smoked, as did Cooper during the flight, and resembled the eyewitness sketches of Cooper. However, the FBI ruled out Christensen because his complexion, height, weight, and eye color did not match the descriptions given by the passengers or the crew of Flight 305. Section 4. Recent Developments On Saturday, November 24, 2007, Coast to Coast AM with Ian Punnett interviewed attorney and amateur D.B. Cooper sleuth Galen Cook about his latest theories on the identity of D.B. Cooper. After his appearance, the son of a man who had identified himself as D.B. Cooper to various members of his family sent an email to Cook. In the email, the son's description of his father's military service, demeanor, personal history, and other details fit Cook's criteria for the perfect suspect. Over the next six months, Galen Cook would make about seven appearances on the show to update the audience on his investigation into that suspect. In February 2008, the radio show released pictures of who the show's producers think may be the real D.B. Cooper, noting similarities in facial features from the Cooper composite sketch. The family of the man in the image came forward after the man's passing and are currently working with the FBI to ascertain if their relative is the real D.B. Cooper. Cook, in accordance with the family's wishes, has stated that the suspect had night-jumping experience as a military paratrooper and, coincidentally, had a brother named Dan, and his hometown's initials, Depoy Bay, are D.B. Cook has speculated further that the man might have known Richard McCoy, Jr. through the military or connections in Utah. On May 24, 2008, on the radio show Coast to Coast AM with Ian Punnett, Cook revealed new information about a suspect whom he said he believed was Cooper. He released new photos of the suspect in conjunction with the program and had previously released photos on the show's website that showed the man's photo next to the FBI sketch of Cooper and a computer composite of the two. The photo came after a man dubbed Greg called Cook, saying he believed his father was D.B. Cooper. According to Cook, the family has been very cooperative, and in addition to information from the family, Cook said he has DNA and a fingerprint from military records from the suspect, which he said the FBI had yet to analyze at that time. Cook said all details about the suspect, including his name, would be released in the Oregon newspaper, the Depot Bay Beacon, on May 28, 2008. Section 4.1 Renewed FBI Interest and New Evidence on November 1, 2007, the FBI released detailed information concerning some of the evidence in their possession, which had never before been revealed to the public. The FBI displayed Cooper's 1971 plane ticket from Portland to Seattle, which cost $18.52. It also revealed that he requested four parachutes, two main back chutes, and two reserve chest chutes. Authorities inadvertently supplied Cooper with a dummy reserve chute. 
an unusable parachute that is sewn shut for classroom demonstration. The dummy chute was not left behind on the plane, and some assume Cooper did not realize it was not functional. This piece of information had been revealed in a 1979 episode of TV documentary series In Search Of. The other reserve parachute, which was a functional parachute, was popped open and the shrouds were cut and supposedly used to secure the money bag closed. On December 31, 2007, the FBI issued a press release containing never-before-seen photos and fact sheets online in an attempt to trigger memories or useful information regarding Cooper's identity. In the fact sheets, the FBI withdrew its previous theory that Cooper was either an experienced skydiver or paratrooper, while it was initially believed that Cooper must have had training to have performed such a feat, later analysis of the chain of events led the FBI to reevaluate this claim. Investigators said that no experienced paratrooper or skydiver would attempt to jump during a rainstorm with no light source. Investigators also believe that, even if Cooper was in a hurry to escape, an experienced jumper or paratrooper would have stopped to inspect his chutes. On March 24, 2008, the FBI announced that it was in possession of a parachute recovered from a field in northern Clark County, Washington, near the town of Amboy. A private property owner was in the process of making a road on the property with a bulldozer when the blade caught some cloth, and his children pulled the cloth until the canopy lines appeared. Earl Cossey, the man who provided the four parachutes that were given to Cooper by the FBI, examined the newly found chute and on April 1, 2008, said that, quote, absolutely, for sure, end quote, it could not have been one of the four that he supplied in 1971. The Cooper parachutes were made of nylon, unlike the new chute that was recovered, which is made of silk and most likely made around 1945. The FBI later made a press release confirming Cossey's findings. Investigators reached their official conclusion after consulting Cossey and other parachute experts. Quote, from the best we could learn from the people we spoke to, it just didn't look like it was the right kind of parachute in any way, end quote, said FBI spokeswoman Robbie Burroughs. Further digging at the site in southwestern Washington turned up no indication that it could have been Cooper's. Section 5. See also. This section includes a list of other Wikipedia articles where you can find additional information regarding the subject matter of this article. The first article is titled, D.B. Cooper in Popular Culture. The second article is titled, Aircraft Hijacking. The third article is titled, List of People Who Have Disappeared. The fourth article is titled, Cold Case. Section 6. Further Reading. This section includes a list of books where you can find additional information regarding the subject matter of this article. The first book is by Ralph P. Himmelsbach and Thomas K. Worcester, published in 1986. The title is Norjack, The Investigation of D.B. Cooper. The second book is by Richard T. Tosaw, published in 1984, with the title, D.B. Cooper, Dead or Alive. This book includes a full list of serial numbers from the $20 notes that were given to Cooper. Section 7, References There are references available in the written form of this article. Please be sure to verify information found on Wikipedia using the references provided or cross-referencing the information yourself. Section 8, External Links This section includes a list of external websites where you can find additional information on the subject matter of this article. Link number 1 is titled D.B. Cooper. Link number 2 is titled FBI FOIA Reading Room Files of the Norjack D.B. Cooper Case. Link number 3 is titled Check6.com, codename Norjack, The Skyjacking of Northwest Orient Flight 305. Link 4 is titled, Radio Interviews About D.B. Cooper's Identity with Major Authors. Link number 5 is titled, November 27, 1971, Account of the Hijacking in the Minneapolis Tribune. Link number 6 is titled, Radio Interview with FBI Lead Investigator Larry Carr. Link number seven is titled, Video Tour of D.B. Cooper Evidence with FBI Lead Investigator Larry Carr. Link number eight is titled, 
PCGS currency notifies FBI of DB Cooper serial numbers. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org/copyleft/fdl.html.